playing now. Game, game playing is fundamentally an emotional process. Fundamentally what's going on is the player is having some sort of emotional reaction to what's happening on the screen. And so all game design must be directed towards whatever emotional process is going on inside that person's head. So it, uh, a game designer does need to know a, de a certain amount of psychology, uh, both at the sensory level, you should know a little bit about the, the optical system, the way the retina works, and important things about the retina do affect game design quite a bit. Um, the oral system, how the ear responds to sound, and also a lot of psychology. I have spent a lot of time talking with psychologists. I have, through, throughout my career, at Atari Corporate Research, I, I had a standing on retainer. I had a psychologist as a consultant. And um, I spent a lot of time talking with her um, in doing the Seaboot design. I had a consultant, a psycholinguist, who helped me both, both on the linguistic aspects of the language that I designed for the game, as well as some of the psychological aspects. I'll give you one small example, by the way, of how important psychology can be in game design. I, uh, at one point I wanted to, I have a database of, of events that happen in Cebu, and I wanted the player to be able to, to know, to, to call up the database and say, what happened in the last five turns regarding this character? Um, so, well, obviously, I, I was going to take the sentences which come out in the Have you all seen the weird hieroglyphic language in Cebu? Trust and Betrayal. Uh, there's this weird language with these icons that stick together to form sentences. Anyway, the history, the database of history was presented in the language. And so I just had something that had the, the history stored in RAM. And if you wanted to look it up, you'd call up a menu option and up would come the first sentence and it would wait a second or two and then the next one would come, the next one would come, the next one would come. Psychologist jumped all over that. Yeah, that's the obvious techie way to do it, she said cutting quick to the quick. Um, uh, but she said that's no good at all because the retina doesn't accept that because the problem is the images are too close to each other. That is, you present one image and then you just wipe it out and you present another image that looks rough. It's this roughly the same shape, only the content is somewhat different each time. Uh, she said, no good with the retina. With the retina, you've got to wipe it clear. And I said, okay, no problem. I'll erase it to white hold it for half a second, and put up the new one. No, no, no. White doesn't clear the retina. You need something. I mean, that's just a null image, and null things don't clear the retina. You've got to have something that erases the retina as well as the screen. So we talked about it. Uh, worked on it. Finally, I came up with an idea that she liked, and this was a bitch to implement. <coughs> I, I did a shimmer dissolve. That is, you'd see the image, and then it would start to, you know, it had a sinusoidal shimmer. That is, you know, the, the, like this. And then it would dissolve away. And that would clear the retina. And then I'd punk up the new one. The idea is you have to, you have to clear out that image. You've got to put up something else that grabs the retina and kind of shakes it a little and before you move on to the next thing. It's exactly the same if you've ever, have you ever eaten at a swanky restaurant where they bring you a course and then they bring you out a little tiny dish of sherbet to clear your palate? It's, it's the same thing. Uh, your tongue is now adjusted to that taste and now we're going to give you a new taste so we've got to clear your tongue off. And so we're, we're not just going to give you water, that doesn't clear the tongue. We're going to give you something that has a little bit of taste of its own, just a subtle little taste clear the palate so we can move on to the next one. Anyway, just a tiny example of how important psychology can be in game design. So, yes, you got to worry about psychology. Yes, you got to worry about the emotions of the people playing the game. This is what we're delivering to people. We're not delivering software. We're not delivering programs. We're delivering feelings to them. We're making them feel things. That is the end that we are attempting to achieve. So we need to focus on the psychology of game playing. I've already talked about game playing among animals, so let me just jump on ahead to challenge. All games challenge the players. 
what is the precise nature of that challenge? What constitutes good challenge as opposed to bad challenge? A lot of people equate challenge with difficulty. That's wrong. Challenge and difficulty are very different. Difficulty is just a measure of, well, how easy is it to win the game? Um, challenge is much closer, much more personal. How does this game hit you? How does it challenge what you are? Now we get into all sorts of things related to self-image. Uh, let me see if I can, I can explain this here. Challenge is difficulty that means something. For example, if I say to you, I want you to pile 300 bricks in a pyramid so they won't fall down. That's difficult. Is it a challenge? No. Uh, suppose I were to tell you, I want you to convince Elaine to double your salary. That's a challenge. <laughs> okay? Because that means something. It's difficult and it has significance. So the question you have to... If you try Richard, it's more difficult. It's a challenge. <laughs> It's all very relative. <laughs> okay. The idea is challenge cuts to something that is significant or meaningful to the player. And so you have to ask the player, what is meaningful to you? Um, so here, here's where a lot of games fail. They, if you challenge the wrong things, uh, you can have an otherwise perfect game, but nobody gives a shit. So the question you, you always ask about a game is, <clears throat> what am I challenging in the player? What is, the, what is it about him? What is it about his self-image that's going to be improved by this? That is, when he says, wow, I got 23,000 points in X game, why does that mean anything to him? Now, um, gee, there are two threads I want to follow. I'm not sure which I want to do first. Um, must be a bushy tree. Yeah, yeah. I need to talk in parallel. Um, let, me, let me talk about the self-image issue here first. What do you want on your tombstone? What do you want? How do you want? How do you view yourself? When you, when you die and they're at your funeral saying, well... Joe was a really great guy because he... what? This, this gets very close to issues of self-image and, and you know, how you see yourself and what's important in your life and so forth. And I would like to ask, would you like your tombstone to say, or would you like your, your eulogy for the person to say, this guy had fantastic hand-eye coordination? I mean, he got Larry three Bird million. Pardon? Larry Bird doesn't mind. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, for some people, that is significant. Um, in a fighter pilot, uh, man, that's the highest price. Say this man's reflexes are like a cat's. Uh, that's important in that field. How many feet? How many people are in a situation like that? Um, what I'm what I'm driving at here is. Uh, I'm not necessarily putting down hand-eye coordination games. What I'm saying is, one of the reasons why most everybody eventually grows out of hand-eye coordination games, or, or let's say grows to a level where hand-eye coordination games they, they play only occasionally, is that hand-eye coordination games don't challenge what's deeply important to people. They're fun, up to a limit, but they don't really grab you in the gut. Um, they can start to do that if they become metaphors, like space invaders is. They can start to reach into some of those things if you feel like, I'm getting back at those bastards. Um, uh, but there's still that, uh, there's still this fundamental limit on, on what they're doing. A really good game is going to challenge what's special about you. Now here we, let me ask you to, uh, rhetorically only, what is special about you? What, what makes you worthwhile? Um, let, let's think about this. Um, you're all 
uh, what engineers, programmers, uh, uh, visual designers, graphic artists, so forth. Let, let's say you're all engineers. Are you the best engineer in the world? No, probably not. Well, you think you're in the top half of a, of a percent? Oh, maybe. Maybe not. One percent? Well, maybe. Well, just think how many engineers there are in the world. Think how many thousands and thousands of engineers there are who are better than you. Pretty depressing thought, isn't it? <laughs> okay, let's talk about, let's say you like to play tennis. Um, think how many tennis players are better than you are. <laughs> think how many people could kick <laughs> your butt <laughs> on the court. Okay, yeah, it's all well, here, let's get really personal. Let's talk about how good you are in bed. Okay? <laughs> Thank how many... David is <laughs> Thank how many people are better than you. Probably. I mean, I mean, it's hard for us to actually do a direct observational, you know, statistical thing. Well, tell you thing. what, my wife is not comparison shopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> but I mean, you know, you watch the movies and hear these actors and actresses and they're, wow, boy, look at the sweat they're working on. Boy, look at the way they wrestle and That's kick and roll and... Special gee, effects. We don't, yeah, yeah, we don't do that. <laughs> think, <laughs> think how much better <laughs> Think how much better there must people, the other people must be than you. In fact, if you think about it, almost anything that you value about yourself, there are probably millions of people I got better a at. For this. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry? I got a burly for this. <laughs> By almost every, I, I like to, uh, okay, I like to give lectures. Imagine how many people there are that give lectures better than I can. You know, on every scale by which we measure ourselves, there's somebody who's better. In fact, there are probably lots, thousands, millions of people who are better at it than you are. Well, that raises a real question. If you were really honest about it, forthright, um, you know, if you were a paragon of self-honesty, you would look at yourself and say, you know, I'm scum. <laughs> Here I am, consuming resources. Here's the world with all these environmental problems and overpopulation. Maybe I ought to just kill myself and stop being a burden to the earth. <laughs> so what makes us worthwhile? Well, everybody has an answer to this. There is a standard answer that everybody has. They, they give it a different twist every time. But the basic answer that everybody gives is, yeah, but you see, I've got my own special touch. See, it's, it's my, my intuition, my, my way of doing things that nobody else can do. I mean, yeah, sure, that guy knows, he can program in machine code faster than I can. But I mean, his code just doesn't have the, you know, the feel that my code has. I mean, oh sure, this guy documents this stuff better than I do. But his code doesn't have the, you know, the eloquence. The, it just doesn't look right. My code, I mean, that's good code. It looks good, it's clean, it's nice, it's fast, it works well. His code, I mean, it's, uh, it just isn't as good as mine. It's, it's, it's just the touch, the feel behind it all. Every one of us has our own little variation on that story. Every one of us. The, the special thing that we can feel proud of is the unique way that the, the, the English we put on the ball as we do things. And we can honestly look at ourselves and say, I can look at myself and say, yes, my lecturing isn't as, uh, as uh, good as that guy's. And true, I don't use those big words or that deep voice, and I can't stare off into the cosmos the way Carl Sagan does. But, you know, that, hey, he doesn't have my dumb sense of humor. And uh, I've, I've, there are just other things I do, and when you put the whole package together, hey, it's Chris Crawford, and nobody does it like Chris Crawford. 
So we all tell ourselves that. That's what we challenge and again. Because that's the one thing everybody can preserve. And when I say challenge, I don't mean question. That's what you want to bring out. You want the player to play the game and walk away from it saying, yeah, I killed that my way. Nobody else could have killed that game the way I killed it. And I really killed it good. <laughs> so you want the game to create that mystical sense that the player can do it his particular way, the way that only he could have done it. Uh, um, and yet he was able to win. The worst thing you could do is to let him play his way and have all his lose. That, that says the wrong thing to the player. That, that goes back to the you are scum argument. So you don't want to do that. Um, an excellent arcade game does that beautifully. An arcade game moves out of the realm of the predictable and into the realm of the mystical. There is a mystical experience in an excellent arcade game. Uh, I'm sure each of us has had that experience with at least one game. There's a certain point when you get really good with the game where you kind of, you know, you're out of body experience and you back away and you're no longer seeing the monitor. You're just drinking it in and you don't even know what your hands are doing. It's just happening. And there's this mystical thing going on where you are one with the game, you know, Montrose. Um, is, uh, uh, and that is the point where you suddenly say, oh, I was playing in this grand mystical way that only I could have played. Um, that's when arcade games uh, really hit their peak for you. Um, darn, there's another point I wanted to make about this aspect of it. Uh, yeah. Um, so you want to challenge the person in a way that's special to him. You want to, you want to, uh, you want to bring out whatever he thinks is important to him. Oh yes, I remember. You familiar with uh, free will versus determinism? The old philosophical problem. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about both sides of the table, right? Here. This discussion yeah. often. Oh, you can get <laughs> there is free will. That's the, like, okay. free will. Okay, for those of you who haven't been in on this, this is an old, old argument that goes way, way back. And the basic problem is either, um, here we go. Here's a guy who's just committed a crime. He murdered somebody. Okay, there are two explanations. Explanation one. He has free will. He, on his own, decided, well, no, wait, wait, let me, I'll, I'll do it, I'll, do, I'll give determinism first. Look, he was abused as a child, all he saw was vile and surrounded, I mean, it was just, uh, he was programmed from the start to kill. Uh, he is uh, a sad, tragic product of our brutal society. What did you expect him to do? It was inevitable, it's not his fault. In short, he's not responsible for it. His actions were predetermined. And then you expand that argument and say, well, everything that humans do is predetermined. Chris Crawford was programmed to be standing here in Chicago on February of 1988 talking to you about all of this crap because that was just sort of built into his genes and the environment. And everything just had to happen this way. I can't take credit for any of this. It was programmed into me. Everything is determined for us. We are merely the manifestation of the laws of physics coming out. And I have no real choice in what I do. It's just everything, the universe unfolding itself. And I am merely an expression of the universe happening. So my actions are determined. The other version is I have free will. I have choice. I control what happens. The universe doesn't control it for me. I make my own decisions. The only problem is, I'm going to give you a twist on this now, because I'm going to say it's not free will versus determinism. All you proponents of free will are going to get upset at this. I'm going to say it's <laughs> arbitrariness versus determinism. That is, either it's determined or it's random. That is, um, either I am forced to do it by the universe, or I just flip coins and go through life doing completely arbitrary things. Um, and, and the problem you get into is neither one of those is a very satisfactory thought. Uh, now, this is the philosophical issue. Now, I'm going to translate that down to something roughly analogous in the game world. That is, every game 
either calculate the answer, hey, it's no big deal, because anybody can see that what you have to do right here is do that, you win the game. So either the game can be determined, you know what to do to win, or it's arbitrary and there's nothing you can do that would win. I mean, the game just has this random number generator and you try out different things and it doesn't matter whether you, what you do, you're still going to basically just win or lose based on the random numbers. So all games are therefore either arbitrary or predetermined. And in which case, they are never satisfied. The question is, how do we get around that dilemma in game design? And this is a, a really common dilemma. For example, a lot of card games are pure chance games. Uh, you know, you just flip the cards and, gee, I happen to come up with good cards, I win. Um, or they're like, uh, I don't want to use chess, um, but they are so simple. Uh, uh, here we go. Here's a determined game, a tic-tac-toe. And you can just look at that game and there's nothing interesting. I know that this happens and that happens. One, you know, you're going to win or I'm going to win. What's the big deal? Uh, it's over-determined. So... How do we resolve this dilemma between arbitrariness and determinism? And the answer, well, actually several answers, one answer is to get into the realm of intuition. That is, you can challenge somebody's deductive skills. I don't like chess, for example, and I think chess is a bad game because it is primarily a deductive game. It is very close to being a deterministic game. That is, you can sit down there, theoretically, and calculate the optimum move. In practice, that never happens, but it is true that theoretically, or that, that in most cases, except when you get up into the grand master level, the person who wins in a game is the person who searches down more plies through the tree. Um, so it's just a, a question of deduction. So chess, in my view, is a very deterministic game. A very good game brings us in there. the solution to this dilemma, the way we sneak out of it, is to get into the realm of intuition. That is, and here's where I come around with this challenge argument, let's get something that challenges the soft and fuzzy side of human nature. Because that, after all, is what we really value ourselves by, these soft things. We don't say, my code runs faster, or my code is cleaner. We just say, it looks better, if the feel of it is better. That's the type of thing we want to challenge in a game. Um, Eastern Front did this very well. Um, in Eastern Front, yeah, there are basic moves. You've got a war game here, and you've got military pieces, and you're going to march them around the board. But the neat thing about the game is you can look at it and say, I'm going to concentrate my forces for a big offensive right near Kiev. Why? Because my gut tells me that's where I ought to attack. I wrote the game, and if you say that to me, I can't tell you you're wrong. I can't, you know, I can look at it and say, I don't know if you'll break through. I, I kind of doubt you'll get a breakthrough there. But I can't just black and white say you're wrong. Um, there's plenty of room for hunches. There's, there's enough uh, plasticity, enough uncertainty in the game that you can't deduce it, but not so much that it is arbitrary. What we want to get into is the realm of judgment, decision-making under uncertainty. That's what a good game challenges. In, even in a good arcade game, uh, uh, an arcade game is mostly hand-eye coordination, but the very best playing of an arcade game actually comes when you transcend the hand-eye coordination and you move into a state where things are happening that you can't quite explain, where the reactions are coming, where, where you are anticipating what's going to happen, and you feel this mystical experience where you feel like you've, you've got the rhythm of the game, and you know what it's going to do next, and you, you make the move almost before something happens. Um, that's the feeling that suddenly moves you up into this, you know, the, the game player's equivalent of a jogger's high, um, where, where all of a sudden that game is deeply involving. Um, let me talk about some of the various uh, types of challenges we can get into here and ways that you can get into this judgmental regime. There's the hand-eye coordination, which we're all familiar with. Resource management is another classic area in game playing. 
Basically, I'm going to put you in a situation you're going to have resources. You're going to have some money here, and you're going to have some troops there, and you're going to have some, some um, trains here, and you're going to have some land there, and some crops here, and some fuel there. And then you're going to manage the resources. You're going to move the fuel, burn up this much fuel and shoot this many rounds of ammo and spend that much money, and you're going to allocate. Well, we do this much money here, and shoot that guy this hard and send two divisions of troops over there. And basically, it's a big management problem. Resource management, mean, there are a lot of variations on this. Hammurabi is the very simplest resource management in the game. A primitive resource management in the game with, what, three differential equations, I think. Very simple stuff. Amazing how, how much, I mean, this game is primitive, and yet, yet it had a big impact. A lot of people played Hammurabi in the early days. Um, resource management. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of games have elements of, of resource management. You know, resource management is one of those factors that gets mixed into almost every game. Um, in fact, I would say it's a demo of why aren't that many games that don't have it? Uh, you know, it shows up in just about every game. Some games are almost all resource management. In some games, it's just a minor component. Uh, you can balance power has a little resource management. You've only got so many troops and so much money to ship around, although that isn't a very important factor at all. Um, so it crops up. Um, resource, so yeah, you're going to use resource management very frequently. Uh, let me warn you, don't go hog wild on resource management, because ultimately resource management is not well suited for getting into the intuitive realm. Um, it is, uh, it is more accountant's work than dreamer's work. And people, you know, you got to dot a lot of I's and cross a lot of T's to do resource management. And so it's hard to get really intuitive, uh, uh, you know, play hunches with resource management. Uh, so that is, that is an area you will need in a game, but don't try to put your game high on resource management. Um, unless you've got some special trick, something that's really going to make that resource management work. Uh, by the way, there is one way to make complex resource management work, and that is if you're having a computer doing a lot of the I-dotting and T-crossing for you. In other words, the player is managing the resources, but his, his role is more that of the big executive saying, ship 23 of these over there, and uh, buy that corporation, do this, do that, and you know, all sorts of complicated things are happening, and the computer's doing it for you then you can get away with lots of complicated resource management. Um, spatial reasoning this is another area of challenge. This is, plays a huge role in a lot of games. Um, two reasons why spatial reasoning is so important in games. One, display. We have a beautiful display. That's our best output format. If we're going to talk to the user, we've got only two ways we can output to them. On a screen and through the speaker. And it's hard to do really great, you know, in evocative, informative things out the speaker. So we're going to rely heavily on the screen, especially this is a visual culture. These people are televisionized, and so they're used to seeing images and getting information in images. So we're going to have, we're going to be very image intensive in our games. And of course, if you're thinking about the game and interacting with an image, then you're going to be doing a lot of spatial reasoning. The other reason is that game design is still very much a male-dominated field, and spatial reasoning is still very much a male-dominated area. Uh, and so we really push that spatial reasoning in our games. In fact, the best example of this, the most ironic thing, by the way, I'm presenting spatial reasoning as opposed to verbal reasoning, which is really the other half of human thinking, the two grand areas of human thinking, spatial and verbal reasoning. And really, there's an... If you look at the, at, the sun, at the totality of human thought through the centuries, there's been lots of work in both areas. It's not as if spatial reasoning is the dominant form of human thinking. I would even argue that verbal reasoning is easily the dominant. However, spatial reasoning dominates in games. Why? Well, we're, we're male-oriented and we've got visual displays. Um, let me point out the most ironic expression Text adventures from Infocom. What's the form of representation? Text. Verbal. Here is a completely verbal environment. And what 
do you do in a text adventure? You pull out a piece of paper and you make a map as you play the game. A text adventure is primarily an exercise in spatial reasoning expressed in a verbal form. That's irony. That shows the iron grip that spatial reasoning has on us as game designers. Uh, I strongly urge you, make every effort you can to break out of that rut, because we are really caught in a bad rut on spatial reasoning. Uh, it is easier to do. It is just so easy to pop a map up on the screen, the, cla the, the absolute classic expression of spatial reasoning is a war game. Uh, here are my units here. Now, if I maneuver them south, I can get them over the river, um, uh, across the bridge, maneuver into the rear of the enemy, and come in behind them. Pure spatial reasoning. Um, you know, the, the end, we got a lot of those. Um, classic arcade game. I'm here shooting here, but if I swing over to the side, I can duck his thing and get in a shot into his flank. Um, spatial reasoning. It's, it dominates everything we do in these games. Um, there are good reasons for it. I'm not saying we should abandon it. Uh, we will have to stay with it. Uh, uh, our games will continue to be spa primarily spatial for a long time. But we've got to start the evolution so that we start getting more verbal reasoning games, truly verbal. Um, here's, where, here's that theory thing again. I was telling you that Seaboot is, is beautiful theory. Seaboot is pure verbal reasoning. I refuse to put a map into Seaboot for strictly ideological reasons. That's dumb, but I was really ideological with this game. Um, they, you know, they were saying this game just is graphically really weak. We need some graphical pizzazz. How about you put a map into it, Chris? No! No! That's spatial! It's not a spatial game! It's a verbal game! And so we did it, even to the point of screwing up the graphics on the damn game. It is a pure verbal reasoning game, so... What yes. stops the player then from pulling out his piece of paper and, and creating a map? And then does it become spatial? That's no, correct. no. Because I don't even tell you where anybody is, and at no point does so that... So it's enemy... unmappable. Yeah, okay. it's unmappable. We simply say, go to this guy's house. You don't know where it is. You just go there and you talk to it. And then you go to somebody else's house, and you don't care where anything is at all. Um, I was very consistent throughout that at no point would spatial considerations enter into so, uh, no, nobody pulls out a map in Seaboot. Well, I, I don't know. First thing I wanted to do was to take all the characterizations and do a map of <laughs> he loves me and I love him and <laughs> he doesn't love me. And I thought the first way I could uh, make some progress in this is making sort of a spatial diagram of the interactions that you presented chart. initially, you know, on the easy game. You say, well, okay, so I should go over to this guy's house and screw him and then go over here. And, and, well, that, that would and be... And that's pretty diagrammatic. Well, actually, I would argue... And that's resource that's another. I would argue that's another expression of this... The way we think is so spatial. We take something that's intrinsically verbal and say, well, how can we translate that into a spatial expression? Um, for example, if you go to the most intense habitué of soap operas, you know, the, the, the lady who can tell you the entire history of Carthaginian. <laughs> <laughs> of every character in the dynasty. Yeah, let's well, see. Oh, let's see. Dallas. <laughs> okay. Okay. I very much doubt that this person is going to draw a map with a grid for you. Yeah, I, see, I, maybe women won't draw this chart. Yeah, the women will just say, well, of course, Jr. feels this way about so and so, and they're, they're just this part. Of, they assimilate the same information in a verbal format. I mean, a lot of that has to do with it. I mean, <laughs> verbally, we think serially, pretty much. I mean, we're, we're taught to read, you know, word by word. Where visually, we can we can grab more than just one idea at a time. Let me let me caution you. Verbal re internal verbal reasoning is not at all serial. The the expression is serial. But the processing that goes on is deeply parallel. Um, and so there are, you know, uh, verbal reasoning can, can really do some funny jump around integration type things. Um, anyway, so spatial reasoning is a dominant form of challenge. You know, we'll present you with a spatial problem. Gee, how are you going to get back? to your house before the cops get there and you plop the pad and so forth. And there's a lot of that in games right now. It's an easy area to work. People are used to it. 
It's easy to display. It's easy. You got a mouse, a joystick. These are basically spatial devices. Um, you know, there are everything is set up to support that. Don't give it up. Don't walk away from it. I mean, you're going against the grain if you walk away from it. But let me point out just as well. There's this huge untapped territory that nobody else has explored called verbal reasoning. It's just it is just as valid as spatial reasoning. It can work. People can do it. There are some special problems associated with it. You'll have to learn new programming techniques or whatever. But the nice thing is, you got no competition. And it's a lot easier to win when there's no competition. So, uh, um, uh, yeah, I would strongly urge you to explore verbal reasoning as a form of challenge. Uh, what do I mean by verbal reasoning? What is that? Well, I don't mean word games, you know, uh, you know, jumble, the scramble, you know, scramble word games, and so forth. Rather, I mean expressions of ideas that are not necessarily, uh, it's the connections of the ideas. If I, let me tell you a verbal reasoning game that I'm working on right now. Uh, this is a proposal I presented to Mindscape last night. They love the basic concept, they shredded the proposal, because there are some serious problems making this thing work. Uh, give me an idea of this, and I, I think you'll see why this is hard, but I think you'll also see why it's interesting. The game is called Lies, and the basic concept is, what is truth? Um, that is, hypothesis formation, you know, when, you, when you're presented, you know how in the real world you'll be presented with all of these things that are true and false, you know, Reagan says if we don't ship weapons to the countries, the communists will be marching up, you know, crossing the Rio Grande in 10 years. And, and then these guys say, yeah, but we're going to get dragged into Vietnam if we do that. And then these other people saying, yeah, and I'm cheap and it costs too goddamn much money. And, and they can't all be right. You know, they're, they're, the reality has all of these statements out there, many of which contradict each other. And they all, there's this web work of truth. You know how... Uh, I'll give you another example. Have you ever uh, tried to get away with a lie and gotten caught at it? You know, lies never work because, uh, you know, you tell your lie and you say, ha, 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 I fooled them. And then you go along and three months later, you happen to make an offhanded comment that has nothing to do with the original lie, at least not directly. But it, uh, it trips a flag in the other person's mind. Well, wait a minute. Uh, if he says that, then this has to be so, but somebody else told me this, which means this. And they work it backwards and they suddenly realize you lied to them. Um, you know, lies never work because truth is a web work and everything ties together. And eventually the lie evidences itself as a contradiction somewhere. And so there's this big web work. And I thought I wanted to think about that. Now that's pure verbal reasoning. Now how am I going to focus that down? There's my magic word, focus. Um, on a simple situation that, you know, so you can clearly see the way that network works. Um, and the other question is, how am I going to present the network? Well, we can present the network visually. I have this great idea for something I want to call, well, how many of you have been in the personal computer business more than five years? Okay, so you remember uh, Visical, um, Visi Right, or was it Visi Word? Visi Word. Visi Uh, well, <laughs> uh, let's see, and there was Visi Chart, and, Busy uh, on. Busy on, the whole Busy on, yes, and the Visi This and the Visi That, well, I call this concept Visi Lie. The idea is we're going to present the structure of truth as this network of propositive statements. And each, all the statements are connected to each other. Wherever there's a causal link, there's a line connected. Yeah, that's not spatial. Sounds like the LSAT test. Uh, Chris, okay. targets. That's a spatial yeah, term. That's a spatial representation of visual reasoning because of verbal reasoning. Because I have a, a, a spatial display. I still have to put out that spatial display. Don't worry about it. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. Let, let I'm sorry. Here. Didn't need to get defensive. It's okay. I am very interested. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to interrupt, but... Okay. I think what you're talking about, I mean, I do agree with you that there is a very big difference between verbal representations and nonverbal representations. 
But I think when you get into this idea of, of there being non-spatial representations, I think you're kind of out of luck because the brain is you know, built on two you know, levels. One is a primitive old brain function, which are based, you know, if use a computer analogy, are basically ROM-based. And then you, have, you know, they're defining the animals, and, you know, so we can compare ourselves with the animals and see there. And you have the cortical functions, which is where, you know, you get the verbal functions. Well, pattern finding is innate in us and in animals, and uh, it's very much how thinking works at a very primitive level. So I think you're going to get stuck with representing things spatially. You're just going to drive yourself crazy by trying not to do it. Okay. I think, but I do think you can have something that does work primarily as a cortical game or as a verbal game. But okay. it's, it's going to have spatial relationships. I will you need to worry about defending yourself. Okay. I will there. certainly yeah. agree you've got to have, I mean, we're coming out on a monitor. We've got a visual display here. That's our best angle. We've got to use that. Um, you know, that forces our hand no matter what. Um, I will say that when we talk about internal brain functions, uh, verbal functions are every bit as active or um, crunchy as the spatial reasoning functions. Verbal reasoning is, ju is just as uh, what valid, intense, uh, uh, cogitative as the spatial stuff. Arguably so. My only point is, is that the verbal structure is built on top of the old brain structure. Okay. So okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll agree with that too. It's stuck with the, you know, the old brain yeah. function. Okay. Um, let's see. So anyway, the lies proposal, uh, the idea then is this, this network of, of statements connecting to each other and uh, leading to contradictions. You know, this statement, crunch, 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 leads to a contradiction. And the idea then is that you can form hypotheses and say, well, what if this were false? And you click on it and say, invert its truth value. Well, if that's false, then crunchy, crunchy, crunch, we recalculate all the truth values. And, oh, no, there's a new contradiction here. That means he must have lied to me, and so forth. So that's the very core of the idea. The problem is I need to build a game around it. And that's uh, where we're having difficulties. My original concept, I originally had a game built around the CIA versus the KGB and who's the mole, Tinker Taylor soldier spy type stuff. Uh, and there, there are people are lying to you saying, oh, yes, well, I gave Michael film to Joe, and I didn't get it to Joe, to Fred, things like that. Um, but I had problems with that, and I walked away from it, and I said, you're infiltrating a terrorist ring. And then they said, well, I gave the bomb to Joe, and I actually gave it the bomb to Fred. Uh, and I had problems with that, and I gave that up after a lot of work. And uh, then I came up with a good one. Uh, jewel thieves, a gang of jewel thieves, and you're all stealing jewels from each other. Uh, uh, that actually worked in game design terms. I was able to actually get a little system up and running where causality was clean and neat. And that's what I walked into Mindscape with. And they said, yeah, the mechanics are great. It's a really dull concept. Blah, 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 and I walked out of the class. So. <laughs> they really like the KGB versus CIA. So I'm going back. I'm going to do it. You know, go back to the microfilm and the defecting scientist and who's the mole and so forth. So I'll, I'll try to make that work. Stop at the star bar. Pardon? We'll show you later. Oh, okay. So uh, anyway, let's see. Where am I? So, various forms of challenge. One last form, interpersonal management. This doesn't exist at all right now, and I think this constitutes the future of game design. Uh, this is one of my soapboxes. I've written about this in the journal. Um, uh, I believe very, very strongly that the entire future of game design lies in interpersonal challenge. Uh, I'll go over this material again. Characters are fundamentally important in all forms of entertainment. Um, uh, can you imagine the movies with no characters in them? The theater with no actors. Literature with no, no characters in it. Uh, and I'm not just talking the highbrow stuff. Let's take Star Wars. If you take Star Wars and you delete uh, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Darth Vader, uh, you know, all of the characters. What do you have left? You have a couple of zap zaps, a big explosion at the end, and we roll the credits. And that's the movie. 
Um, in other words, characters are what make the movie good. This, this is a very important point. A lot of people think that what made Star Wars great were the special effects. And that's bull. Uh, what made Star Wars great was the story. The special effects helped the story. But there were plenty of things that came out after Star Wars that had special effects as good as or better than Star Wars. But Star Wars was a great movie because it was a great story, enhanced by special effects. Characters are what make the story. Uh, Tennessee Williams, somebody, some big shot once said that the way to write a great play was to create some interesting characters and then just plunk them down on the stage and figure out how they interact. Um, he was exaggerating, but his important point was that the characters are so central that, that they dominate everything. Uh, so, so characters are what make movies go. Characters are what make stories go. Literature, theater, everything, really. If you, if you step way back and look at human entertainment, what we really spend all of our time entertaining ourselves with is each other. And how we interact with each other. That is what is most interesting. Um, now let's look at computer games. What kind of characters do we have in computer games? Well, we don't have any. But we have things. You shoot things, and you chase things, and things shoot you, and things chase you. But there are never any people in it. But we, but are, aren't, aren't you the character? Um, I mean, well, isn't that the difference? Normally, you're a little blip there that goes kaboom. And that's all, all that's you are. A, that blip is representing you. You're attached to that blip. Yeah, but, but how much of yourself is in the blip? I mean, if that blip were really you, that blip would be able to uh, uh, to do the things you can do. All the damn blip can do is go bang, 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 or gobble, 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 or whatever. That how much of you is that? Um, it's, it's only a tiny subset. Well, that's subset. your subset of reality that you were speaking about earlier. It seems. Yes. And I, I mean, like when I play Robotron, that little guy becomes me. Yeah. There's no doubt about that. I am that goofy little guy. Yes. When, he, when he dies, yes. I die. Yes. You become yes. the guy in his characters. Yeah. But, but in any event, that little guy, I mean, consider what a it's tiny me. character he is, and I mean in terms of human personality. <clears throat> I mean, let's talk about... You know, the, the vastness of human personality. You know, the, the uh, cheap movie uh, the title, you know, the, the Agony of the People, the Greed of the Conquerors. <laughs> and then we, you know, um, uh, and then we have this little guy here. What does he do? Well, he walks around and he goes bang, bang. You know, it's, he, yeah. is, he is uh, small in, in the sense of the word when we say that's a, he's not very big. Uh, he's not a big man. Uh, these characters... Think how expressive they are. Think that, um, I mean, uh, actually, you want a better character. I'll give you a good one. Uh, the best character I've ever seen in any computer game is Floyd the Robot That's in Planet Fall. Um, Floyd is a cute guy who does funny things, and then he dies. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, and the idea is it's supposed to be a scare joke. That's like reality. Floyd never got that far. And he goes, I'm like and he does funny things, and you get to know him, and you get to like him, and then late in the game, he sacrifices himself and dies for you. Oh, oh dude, poor Floyd. You feel terrible. Um, but, in that same game, if at the beginning of the game, Floyd walks up to you and you say, Floyd, you stinking cannibals, you are wretched, you're horrible, I, I hate your lousy stinking guts, Floyd. Well then, Floyd is a cute guy who does funny things and then dies. And, if when Floyd first encounters you at any point, you say, Floyd, Floyd, I must have you. Let's go in the back room and do our natural acts together. Well then, Floyd is a cute guy who does funny things and then dies. Because, you see, Floyd is a fake. He doesn't care about you. He doesn't even know you exist. He's just a little puppet that goes through a routine. He doesn't interact with you at all. As a character, he... I mean, in all of computer gaming, we do not have a single character as rich, as deep, as subtle, as complex, as intricate, as Gilligan from Gilligan's <laughs> <laughs> We have yet to rise up to the level of bad television. That's how bad we are. <laughs> so, um, 
that that we got our work cut out for us. If we really want to get uh, good games, we're gonna have. I mean, it will be a great day in computer gaming when we have Gilligan come out and you know say his dumb things or whatever. That will be a landmark, a major artistic triumph if we can get that good. Or Dr. Smith from Lost in Space. I don't know. No, no, no. We had Space Fury, the one-eyed guy. Yeah. He's really one-dimensional, <laughs> though. He just insulted you and your parents. So wouldn't that be a Gilligan simulation, then? It wouldn't be a game? That's right. That, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 that's true. He that would just be a character in a game. That's, but that's the point. Yeah. No, we want no. you make it against that TNR. Yeah, we, 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 yes. yes. we never talk about motivation. We never talk about motivation in, in the computer game group that they do sprites or entities <laughs> or characters. We never think about why they do things. Right. Here it's we all get just into physical reaction. Artificial personality, as a, as distinct from artificial intelligence. Um, we, if we're going to have these characters. We've got to equip them with artificial personality. We've got to give them feelings so that they can react to you. We can't just give them little scripts where they walk out on stage and say, Hi, I'm a cute guy. I'm going to do funny things and then I'm going to die. And then they just walk, they do their script and then they walk off stage. They've got to react to the player. So they, they walk in and if the player says, I hate your stinking guts, they get mad, their feelings get hurt, whatever. They respond as people. That's when, what I'm imagining here is a game where there are characters whom you interact with as if they were people. Now this is, um, I'm talking Wild Blue Yonder, but if you, but I'm not that far out in the Wild Blue Yonder, go play Trust and Betrayal. That's what I was shooting for. Now those characters, they're still not as good as Gilligan. They're still really pukey characters. But if you want to see a first cut at the problem, if you want to see that it can be done, maybe not well, but it can be done, Play that game. It'll give you an idea of of what I'm what I'm dreaming of, not what I can deliver. I'm a little confused, and maybe you can clear this up. Early on, you said, of course, if I walk out in the street and slap some guy alongside the face, he's going to slap me back, and that's that's reality. Yeah. Um, and if you move in this direction with these characters to the point where they're interacting on that level, aren't you in that at that point moving more toward reality, which is not necessarily a desirable goal? Uh, I guess this is where I'm. I'm a little bit confused, a little bit fuzzy. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I see the, the ambiguity you've pointed out. Yes, there is an ambiguity in that we're getting closer to reality. The thing is, we don't have to... That The first comment is a matter of scale, from zero to a hundred. How, how realistic are we? And I'm pointing out, if you push too far down the scale, yes, you start losing some of the fun of a game. This is a different dimension where I'm saying what we want is characterization. Um, I'm not saying our characterization is insufficiently accurate. I'm saying we don't have any at all. So let's move uh, out that scale a bit. I don't, even if we could, and we can't, even if we could put a, a real human personality inside a computer, we wouldn't want to. Why, right. why you know, geez, it gets so complicated and you gotta go through all this stuff. It'd be much simpler to have uh, a television character like Gilligan, who is a simplification of reality. Let's interact with him. Let's interact with Dr. Smith or Darth Vader or Luke Skywalker. I mean, Luke Skywalker is just your basic nice guy. He's not going to, you know, uh, uh, rape your kid's sister or something like that. Hey, he's <laughs> Luke. What do you expect? Uh, he's a simplification of reality. Uh, um, so, um, Yes, I'm still arguing for simplification of reality. I'm saying we have to move in a new dimension because right now we're at zero. So, uh, well, you know, that, that, it, it reminds me of the argument I took of a film class where even a documentary, no matter how hard the director tries to mimic reality, he'll never be able to do it because it's a two dimensional surface. Yes. So, you might present something in a very realistic fashion, but it's not reality. Yeah. And that really doesn't that diminish the entertainment value of. Of course. Of the, uh, documentary. Back to your original comment, I don't think that this characterization is really moving any more in the direction of reality. It's in a whole different scale. I mean, we are closer to reality in our physical representations of things than this is in our representation of characters right now. I mean, it's... How do I describe what I'm trying to say? <laughs> it's not necessarily more realistic than what we have 
now because it's a completely different field. They're not even compared. Right. right now we have very realistic flying games, okay, which are much closer to reality than than zero. But this is, is a no, completely different the scale. Of face. Well, it's a different subset of reality. Of face of right, it's yeah. a different subset of reality. And that other subset, we're, we're getting closer to reality. This subset hasn't even been started. Yeah, this is completely virgin territory. Uh, you move into here, and basically you're competing with just one person, me. And that isn't that much competition. I mean, uh, imagine, basically imagine we're standing on the edge of the Mississippi River looking off into, you know, Rocky Mountains and saying, well, I'll take everything north of Kansas, you take everything south. You know, we've got a lot of I don't care how, how, how bushy is Trust and Betrayal. I mean, did you were very, very bushy. You can really take that in a lot of different directions. Um, I don't know that the bushes are fun, but, uh, I mean, that's a very subjective thing. Right. I can say in design theory terms, the intensely bushy. I, I guess I've been sitting here. One of the one of the mild problems I have with seeing this is seeing this as what we've done so far, and this is the next step above that, as to saying this is higher and better, and and, and obviously making this lower and not as better. And in, in the, when you listed all your examples, uh, the theater and literature and films, all these things with character, I was sitting thinking. But there are, there are other artistic endeavors which are occupy a lot of our time, which aren't characterized. And I thought, what is the main one? And, I come, and I come to music. Yes. And then I think, OK. Paintings? Well, well, yeah, paintings. But there's more character in paintings, I think, than there is in music. And you take, except for really sappy songs that tell a story, you know, like Honey. Yeah. Or, you know, we, get, we yeah. isolate that body and get rid of that. And then we say, the large body of music, in particular, yes. when you get to pure music without lyrics, here's an activity that is almost devoid of characterization, yes. but yes. highly emotional, yes. and occupies a large body of the recreational time of people. And then I would say, based on that, that I would rather see this field running parallel to this one, instead of stacked on top of it. I would say... Oh, okay. Here's our field, and every a lot of the effort have been achieved in terms of arcade-like and, and, and visual, you know, yes. music-type activities. That's what an arcade visual. game is like. It's a music experience, pure process. Yes. Okay. Right. And here's an area. It's an empty field now. A little bit of work that's being done that you know may be risen, rise to this level of achievement also. But I don't see it as here we are. Primitive, we're going to stack this stuff on top of this. Okay. Which is what I was trying I to say. Fully. They're two different. Yeah, I, I agree fully that music is a realm of art that suggests an area in which computer games could move um, that, that is just completely outside the discussion I'm giving right now. Um, I will not argue that characterization is exclusively uh, the future of games. Uh, I do feel. No, my, my, I, my, my point was that music is essentially the metaphor for what computer games have done so far. An activity which is essentially devoid of characterization, but certainly rich and fulfilling, because people have spent a lot of time doing it, not just because that's all we could do so far, and that what what you're in the ways in which you'd like to see the interactive medium grow are in parallel to what's already been done here, not stacked on top. I think what they I think what you're saying Dave. Yeah. I mean, the only reason I stopped you is I don't think that that the way music is, is is where computer games, you know, the point of characterization would grow. I think that's where they've been as an activity. Okay. okay. Now, there's, there's an emotional issue to be clarified here, which is that without question, I'm suggesting it's totally untapped territory and one that should be explored. I mean, it's, you know, it's very obvious it's there. Frankly, computers handle text a whole lot better than they do pictures and sounds. So, you know, no reason, you know, not to be exploring it. Well, the only reason I think you're moving it into a a more sophisticated realm in, a, in one sense. But on the other hand, I do think that, it, like Dave said, that it's a distinct area. Amusement parks have absolutely no character whatsoever, and I really could live without all the other people there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yes. not there yes. to interact with them. Yes. <laughs> the, main, the only reason I'm analogous to, I mean, let's say past entertainment has had, simplifying this incredibly, has two paths. There's, there's the musical, non-characterized, side of entertainment, okay. and there yeah. was the plays, movies, television side of entertainment. Yeah. Now, taking 
video games or computer games we've had. So far we've developed along the musical path, the not characterized path, and we have done nothing in the other path. Okay. But they are yeah. two separate paths, not necessarily, this isn't the next stage in okay. the musical yeah. path. If, if I I'll, accept I'll that, that I have less trouble. See, I, you see, in the journal, one of the people, you know, got big into saying, well, we are ultra primitive. And in a very pejorative sense, putting down everything that's been done, what I know, having been involved with it, and in my own personal taste, I know that some of the hand-eye coordination things and the arcade things are the process of extreme amount of human effort yeah. and, and are worthy of, of having lavished lots of time on them in design and in playing them. And so to say, but that's, that's very low. We're going to go from here to a higher okay. level. I, I, I find it so, easier so, to so, accept it by toast. saying this is different ground that will be yeah. right now. Yeah. 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 Throw okay. a musical metaphor into the ground. We've been writing rock and roll, and it's been going just so. fine. And you'd like to do grand opera. We're really Ooh. glad to hear that. Yeah. I think it's worth doing. But oh. no, I mean, seriously, because we're talking character, you're talking a lot of things. I don't right. think it's such a yeah. bad analogy. Okay, okay, yeah. The only I thing I would, rather than saying comedy. grand opera, see, yeah. grand opera suggests yeah. elitism. Uh, you know, it could be. Uh, okay, you want to do all the whole thing. Walk on the wild side. Yeah. Yeah. I have yet to see a walk on the wild side in a video. Yeah. 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 Okay, so I, okay, you I'll agree with you. Uh, I, I like your, your representation better. The, 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 this consensus thing, and there, there are these two tracks. And I, and I will admit that I feel utterly ignorant in this track that leads into, into music that, that is analogous or parallel to music. Um, I do want to emphasize, I feel we've got a lot of very nice unexplored territory in the characterization area. Um, so, um, that is another area of challenge. One nice thing is, people, you walk in with a lot of nice preconceptions there, in the sense that you don't have to explain a lot of rules to people. If you say, you're going to interact with these people here, well, your player already knows, gee, if you treat people badly, they get angry at you. You don't have to make that a rule. It's, it's intuitively obvious. And so they can walk into a complex situation involving a lot of judgment, and you don't have to tell them all these details about the specific environment which they find themselves in. The, this is a double-edged sword. Um, you have to be real careful here. Um, they're going to walk in with expectations of behavior. They're going to expect the characters to behave like real people, and your characters won't behave like real people. And somehow, you have to make sure that you don't trip people up with their own expectations. That's kind of tricky, but uh, uh, there are ways around that, primarily by limiting their range of expressiveness, so that it's impossible for, for them to say the things that they couldn't do anyway. You know, like, one, of, one of the things that kind of struck me is, is kind of funny, that in going back to early, early in the day about cinema work, and then talking about the verbal advantage, I think people that play computer games, video games, arcade games, any game, want to use as many senses as they possibly can, whether it be hearing, sight, feel. If my game burns a coil, well, that's not a good one, but it's, it's still, you know, I don't know if if you actually you have to use all the advantages that you can in trying to create a verbal product. Uh, I know it's more cerebral or something else, or it's a what? different tack, but I don't know if it's as if it is, if it can ever get as enthralling. Uh, let me talk about that. I, I have something about that somewhere in here. One, I intend to talk about that problem later, but let me address that issue of the sensory thing. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about something a little different than the question you raised. I may be playing straw man here on you. Uh, let me go ahead with it and you can cry foul if I really am. Um, the caricature that I have frequently seen is the uh, is an idea presented by Bernie DeCoven. Any of you know Bernie? Uh, I'm, I'm about to roast Bernie here. Um, Bernie has come up with a lot of weird ideas, and he was once interviewed by some magazine about the computer game in the future, and his description of it is the perfect caricature of what I think is really stupid about this line of reasoning. And he said, well, in the game of the future, there will be this room, and you walk into the room, and there will be these little sensors that you put on your hands. And, uh, and the, 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 you'll have sensors all around it, so you can, as you move your body, the computer will know where your hands are. 
and it'll present a holographic image of whatever you're, you know, you're, you're fencing with somebody and has a holographic image so the computer knows where you are. And um, it'll, it'll have olfactory things so that if you stab somebody, it'll pump the smell of warm blood into the brain. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> Anyway, the idea was, let's just go hog wild on the sensory aspect of it. Now, the objections I have to this are, first, this is, uh, this is extrapolatory thinking. That is, during the early 80s, the thrust, much of the thrust of computer game development was sensory. That is, let's get the resolution of the display higher, let's get more colors, let's get faster animation, uh, let's get the sounds, you know, get bigger loudspeakers there so we can go down to lower frequencies on the booms. And basically, we're just pushing the, the sensory aspects. And there was a good reason why. In 1978 and 79, the things you were looking at were these little square dots, and they were stinko. Any of you ever see Custer's Revenge? Yeah. And, and the little stick figure out in there is pretty stupid here, aside from the tastelessness. The graphic representation was ghastly, and so there was the uh, uh, so there was this whole. We spent years pushing against those limits, just trying to get a minimum acceptable level of sensory authenticity. And the problem is, after you fought a problem so long, you internalize it and just keep going, and you overshoot. Um, you know, with car design, automobile design. It took them a long time to get cars that could reliably and safely go faster than about 50 miles an hour. 50 miles an hour was sort of a magic number. And then, actually it was in the 30s, they started, they, they sort of blew past that. And in the, by the late 40s, they could produce cars that could go very fast. Uh, and there were, you know, there were some overpowered cars that just went too goddamn fast coming out in the 40s and early 50s. And, um... And it took a while before we realized, you know, hold back, guys. Just because you can build it that good doesn't mean that it's desirable to do so. Um, I think we're seeing much the same thing in game design, where we've struggled against this problem for so long that now that we finally solved it reasonably well, we just keep extrapolating. And I'm not saying we can't do better. There's still a need, uh, not just a desire, a true need to get more resolution and more colors and so forth. But let's not just extrapolate that out to infinity. Uh, uh, the sensory components are not are a way of communicating to the player. They communicate. They do communicate affect, and we want to communicate affect, not just cognitive stuff. Um, but uh, not only must, when you get into a situation, not only must it look right and sound right, it must act right. That's the real essence of what happens in the game. That the, whatever you're interacting with, yes, it has to look real, but more important, it has to act real, or at least act like your fantasies expect. And I would say our shortfall is much greater in the acting area, in the operational area, what it does, than what it looks like. Um, yeah. Well, I think your, your prime example is the 1983 AMOA. Every manufacturer came with their Laserdisc game. Mach yeah. 3, and Gold, and Gold, yeah. and Star Rider, and the game of the show was track and field. It was competitive, physical, non-violent. Yeah, I, mean, I'm, I, I have a whole little mini lecture on video disc or, games. How about this afternoon? Uh, it's a sensor, I forget what it was called, sensor around in the theater. Oh, yeah. You get the feel. Oh, yeah. That didn't wash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, sensory stuff, th there's a fad component, and you can make money on fads. But if you have any brains in your head, you realize it's a fad, and it's going to go away in six months, so let's get our money and get out quick. Um, uh, there is also a substantial aspect to the sensory component of gameplay. Uh, the sensory component does enhance the experience, but you have to balance. That is, you're presenting an overall experience. You're creating a fantasy here. You want the person to get lost in the fantasy. And it, you want it to look right, you want it to sound right, and you want it to act right. Make sure you've got all three. A lot of game designers make the mistake of making it look great, making it sound great, and it acts like shit. 
that I mean, the, more often than not, the shortfall is on how it operates. Make sure the gears and pulleys inside the android's head all do neat things, rather than just uh, you know the android's uh, skin is uh, is done properly. What, what is your definition between trend and fad? Mm. Uh, fad dro uh, drops off. Trend is, is secondary when it continually increases. Yeah, it's the same argument for colorization of films, if it, to me, anyways. Uh, um, I mean, if it doesn't, uh, a film might have been originally done in black and white, adding color doesn't necessarily enhance. Not that. It doesn't make it a better film. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I wanted to bring up the black and white. Sometime, uh, just as an exercise, go back and watch one of those early Charlie Chaplin films. Watch City Lights sometime and see what a real master can do in a limited environment. You compare City Lights with any, with, with Star Wars, with Terms of Endearment, with uh, China Syndrome, Network News, any great 70s or 80s movies, uh, it can stand up and hold its own against any of them. Even with color and Dolby Sound and, you know, what, 80 millimeter film and all of that stuff, that old black and white, Beautifully done art, artistry can stand up to anything. So uh, uh, that doesn't mean Charlie could have probably done better work if he'd been to working with Sensei around and Technicolor and all of that. But a great artist is not confined that much by a medium, so long as the medium is good enough. A VC an Atari VCS is not good enough. Uh, an 8-bit 48K 64K machine is not good enough. We're starting to get there, though. We start talking about an Amiga, and the limitations are much more in your own head, your artistic limitations, than the hardware limitations. We're starting to get to the point where the hardware and is even, not the primary limitation. Uh, even the games you see so far for the Amiga, is, there's a lot of graphics and sound, but not much behind them. The, the know, games we're seeing on the 16-bit machines are just 8-bit games writ large. Let's just take our, our old Apple II game and let's make the graphics a little better and sound a little snazzier, but it's still just the same old game we were doing five years ago. It's because the publishers won't pay for anything more than that. Well, I think, actually, I think it's because art moves more slowly than technology. You can, you can do technological advances real fast, but boy, art is hard, slow work. It takes a long time to get better. So we're following. The artistic side of what we're doing is falling behind the hardware. You know, Bally pulled the plug in the Amiga project. Oh, they did? Mm -hmm. What so project was that? They were doing Amiga-based... Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Well, well there's other took people too that long are to arcade. Okay, let's so, see. Oh. Whoa, half an just didn't have the, the best kind of deal. Let me talk about some of the motivations people have for playing games. I'm, I'm going to try to rush through some of this stuff here because some of this is a little pop psych here. Um, motivations for playing games. Fantasy exploration. People like to get in a strange environment and live out their fantasies. Most people, when they think of fantasy, they think of D&D. You know, wizards and dragons and princesses and all that. Okay, great. That's fantasy, but uh, I can tell you a lot of other fantasies that are just as valid. Fantasy... You're in the office, and there's this cute chick next to you, and you say, Hey, chick, what are you doing tonight? Oh, let's go out to dinner. That's a fantasy. Um, and it's a perfectly nice fantasy. Um, there are a million. Do not underestimate the capacity of the human mind to generate fantasies. If you want to get an idea of how many fantasies there are, go into your video store. There's one fantasy for every videotape there. There's a lot of fantasy stuff out there. Um, Please, let's not stick ourselves in that rut that says fantasy is D&D. &D. Um, uh, let's give people the opportunity to explore. I'm a corporate executive uh, with lots of power destroying people's lives. <laughs> That's a fantasy. Uh, so anyway, millions of fantasies. Um, how about the, the prostitute with the heart of gold? There's a fantasy. Um, <laughs> Um, nose thumbing. This is an important one and it has played a large role in arcade games. You get the opportunity to do something socially unacceptable. I get to kill people. They won't let me do that in real life. And you know how many times I want to knock somebody's block off? 
you know, you get in traffic, and some idiot turns in front of you, and deep down inside, something says, you know, I'd really like to blow that bastard's brains out. But you know that that would be socially unacceptable. So you don't. Well, in a game, you can. <laughs> so, uh, a game lets you do uh, uh, a lot of unacceptable things. Balance power, start World War III, and then you lose if you do that. Um, so, no stunning is a very interesting motivational area to explore. Proving oneself, this is uh, appropriate for the adolescents uh, who are still locked up in this thing of I've got to prove that I'm a man and so forth. So, okay, let's give him a game where he rescues the princess from the dragon and so forth. Uh, very common thing, and lo and behold, there's some people a lot older than 14 years old who indulge in this fantasy. Fine. Uh, it is just one of many possibilities. Uh, need for acknowledgement. This one's important. Um, we don't get acknowledged that often. And we, we really need people to stop and, and look us in the eye and say, you know, I appreciate who you are. Um, you know, maybe not in so many words, but in some way to respond to you, you know, see, as, as society gets larger and larger, more centralized and more specialized, um, you know, you spend a lot more time, maybe not standing in lines, but still being stamped out. You go and you get your McDonald's burger that everybody else eats, and you go to the bank, and you're customer number 42, 23, 15. And, and you know, this is one of the fundamental things in modern life, people revolting a, a, against the sense that they're a cog on, on a wheel. Um, and one of the ways they like to break out of that is to have somebody stop and say, Why? You're special! And a game lets them do that. A game responds to them and says, Oh, you hurt me, you shot me, you did something. Um, that's acknowledgement. Uh, that is one of the things that a game does for people. It lets them, it, it, it in some way, intelligently acknowledges their existence as a human being. That's one of the things we're giving them. Um, a bad game is not going to treat them as somebody special. Uh, a bad game will just sort of treat them, make them feel like they're just one of the customers. What about insults? Uh, God, that's, that's, that's tricky because a good insult does acknowledge it, but the insult has to be uh, catered to. Um, uh, I, I was mentioning something earlier today, the uh, advisory function in Seaboot. One, here's a real nice trick you can put into a game. Um, Watch the player's behavior. Have some routine that's monitoring his behavior and analyzing what he's doing. And you don't have to have lots of hairy artificial intelligence. If you think about it hard, you can come up with a few little indices. You know, what's the ratio of this action to that action in an arcade game? What's his lag time uh, between the first appearance of the monster ship and the time he moves away from it? Uh, you know, just. You know, treat yourself as a scientist. Say, I'm taking data on the player. And you're gathering this information, and then you're evaluating it, and if a number sticks out, say, my God, he consistently fails to blank. Then stop the game, interrupt the game, or whatever. At some point, come up and say, friend, you're not doing it right. And you tell him what he's doing. Now you're acknowledging him as a person. You're telling him something special about him. I bumbled onto this trick with uh, Patton versus Rommel, uh, where we put up little, uh, we, we turned the AI around, and turned it on the player. And actually, it was strictly a patch job. Our problem was that the AI took too long to crunch. We were thinking, how are we going to get around this fact that it goes away for 30 seconds? We came up with this great idea. At the beginning of the AI scheme, we'll turn the AI, point it at the player, analyze his behavior, see if we can find any mistakes. And then, We'll put a window up on the screen that has Patton, if you're the American player, or Rommel, if you're a German player, looking at you saying, you failed to manage your traffic flow through your most congested area, or whatever. He, he, he will give you a verbal representation of what you're doing wrong. And then that window just stays up there for about 30 seconds while the player looks at it and says, huh? And then, when the AI is over, a button comes up that says, OK. No, only it doesn't say, okay, it says, yes, sir. And uh, if you're the German player, it says, jawohl. Um, so basically, it was a cover, but it was a nice trick, and I did the same thing again in Cebu. So that's a way to acknowledge the player's existence. Um, 
Finally, social lubrication. I've never done this, but a very valid function of games is merely to provide a way for people to get together and have fun together. Uh, Dan Button is the, the prime exponent of this philosophy, and he does it magnificently. Um, let me give you one good example. How many people remember Trivial Pursuit? A truly execrable design. This game really stank. Why did it work? Strictly for its social lubrication properties. It was not, I mean, playing that game solitaire was a total waste of time. Really dumb. Playing it with two people was almost as bad. The value of Trivial Pursuit was a bunch of adults could get together, sit around a table and play this game, and really the trivia questions were meant to be conversation starters. It was really a conversation piece. You all get together, then they read off the question, and everybody laughs. And if you get it wrong, hey, it's no big deal. Everybody knows that's trivia. Who cares? But gee, then you start talking, you know, it says, you know, what is the surface temperature of mercury? And everybody looks, oh, I don't know. And then somebody says, a uh, thousand degrees or whatever. And then somebody else says, you know, it really was hot yesterday, wasn't it? I nearly baked my head off. And then, oh, yeah, it was so hot out at my place. Blah, blah, and we all start talking. That's the value of Trivial Pursuit. Um, Dan Button, as I've said, has done this very well. Mule is an excellent social lubrication game. Robot Rascals is another good example. Um, unfortunately, these games have been financial failures. The problem here is that social lubrication games don't match the audience. Computer people are not very social. That's one of the bitter, brutal truths of the world. Computer people are isolated. They like to be alone. They really don't want to gather around the computer and have a good time. If they were, they probably wouldn't be computer people. So, uh... I don't think most people have their, their C64s hooked up to the large family TV anyway. It's in their desk or in right. their office. So it's right. The physical layout. That might be changing too, don't you think? Might be, but I suspect this is going to be a very slow change. Not until they build it into the TV. Yeah, <laughs> yeah once it's built into the TV, they then do we CBI. got a shot. Yeah. yeah the then we got a part of the video player. player then. But I think you'd be a fool to plan on a game along those lines just yet. <laughs> give it, give it a decade or so. So, uh, okay. Last point I want to talk about is the evolution of taste. I've been talking about the psychology of game playing, the motivations, why people play games, what goes on inside their heads as they're playing the games. Let me now point out that these things aren't static. The way people approach a game changes with time. There is such a thing as taste in games, and that taste is not the same for all people, and it's not even the same for one person. One person's taste changes. And there is a basic principle at work here that I want to really drive home to you. Uh, it's very important retrospectively, but it also has some significance for the future. This goes under the headline, The Four C's, Candy, Comic Books, Cartoons, and Computer Games. Because they're all the same. Or at least they were all the same once. I gave this lecture to you, three of you have already heard this lecture, and uh, I gave it, my first version of it was given at UCLA. Um, um, for this uh, seminar, UCLA Extension was doing. Anyway, um, I'll start off by talking about candy. The, what distinguishes candy is that it is an intensely pleasurable gustatory experience. And the two points, intense and pleasurable. I mean, a pepper is an intense experience, but I wouldn't call it intensely pleasurable. It's intensely different special, but it's not, I mean, your tongue doesn't say, wow, that's really nice. You go, whoa, wow. That's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not, I mean, you don't call somebody my little soury. Um, you call them my little sweetie. Um, sweetness is, is nice, pleasurable, whatever. So candy is sweet, candy is intensely pleasurable. Um, that's the first observation I'll make about it. Second observation, you take candy in small doses. You don't eat an entire, you know, you're not, it's lunchtime, you're not going to go down, uh, have yourself, uh, you know, a uh, uh, licorice spaghetti with hot fudge sauce drenched in M&Ms and, you know, washed down with chocolate-flavored soda pop and, 
Now that's... <laughs> so you can take candy in small doses. Why? Because it's intense. You know, when you're intense, you have this high peak that's very narrow. So you always take candy in small doses. And the other thing is, you grow out of candy. Naive people like candy. Kids. Kids who, who've never eaten any more. Give me that candy. Eat lots and lots of candy. But there's an evolutionary process in their taste. That is, when you're young, you go for that really intense experience, candy. Candy is a kid's favorite food. But after a while, after you're a kid, you've eaten so much candy, you start to get a little sick of it. Now you're a teenager. Hey, I don't eat just candy. I eat pizza, anchovies, and hamburgers, and hot balls with lots and lots of ketchup. Yeah. And that's, you know, teenager food. Still intense, but notice the peak is not as high as with candy. And also, the, 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 the curve is a little wider. That is, you eat, you eat candy in this much of a dose, but you eat hot dogs in that much of a dose. And you don't eat hot dogs all day long. Well, teenagers eat hot dogs all day long. They got iron stomachs. But, um, you know, you still, basically, we're seeing the curve getting uh, shorter and wider. The meal that you eat of a hot dog is a larger, longer meal. Um, Still, you just don't eat five hot dogs at one setting. You don't have an entire meal of hot dog. It's meant to be sort of a mini meal. Um, uh, as you grow older, your taste evolves in two ways. Uh, your, your gustatory taste. One, you see more subtlety. Translation, less intensity. Two, you see more variety. That is, after a while, those wild foods, you know, well, maybe let's go to Chinese food, Mexican food. And you get older, and well, how about something a little more subtle? Steak with bolognese sauce. Um, uh, and then eventually you get so old that you like French cooking. Um, <laughs> which is so subtle, I taste it. It all tastes the same to me. I just can't. Uh, someday, maybe uh, my palate will be evolved enough that I can appreciate it. But right now, I'm not that far down the path. Uh, so basically, your taste evolves. Oh, sure, you still eat a little candy every now and then. And, yeah, you might eat some loud foods like pizza, hot dogs, or hamburgers occasionally. Uh, but you do move in the direction of greater subtlety. And the other thing you seek is more variety. A steak, you must try some Italian food. And, boy, have you ever tried any of that neat uh, uh, Vietnamese cooking? And, you know, you start exploring more and more things because you get bored of the same old stuff. So your taste evolves. Um, now let's look at, uh, and let me point out, candy, then, is characterized as an intensely pleasurable subset of a large gustatory universe. Huge number of foods out there. And naive people who've never eaten a lot of things before, they love candy. But as you, after you've eaten a lot, your taste evolves in the direction of less intensity, more subtle, and more variety. Comic books, exactly the same story as candy. Uh, intense? I mean, Good guys, you know, hey, bright, loud colors, real bad guys there. Um, all, whenever they say anything, they have exclamation points at the end of every single sentence. Um, the, uh, uh, the tip of, now, I don't want to talk about the new generation. There's a new wave of comic books coming out that are a little different. Let's go back to classic comic books from the 60s, 50s, 40s. The, uh, you know, raw, uh, Batman and... Uh, Green Lantern, was it? And all of those. Flash. Yeah, real, real good guys, real bad guys. Intense conflict in story terms. Same basic idea. Very intense, very pleasurable. The good guy comes in and gets the bad guy. Bonk him on the face. Hit him on the head. Knock him out. Throw him off the building. Do bad things to that bad guy. Vanquish him utterly. Um, and that the good guy was just a really good, good guy. And there was never any moral equivocating going on here. The good guy just plain clobbered the bad guy. That's the way it is. Very intense, good versus bad. Bright colors. Everything about it is simple, clean. We don't have character development or any complicating factors like that. Just straight good conquers evil. Um, very intense. And what do we see? Naive people? Uh, like comic books. You don't see kitties going out and saying, Oh, wait, give me Tolstoy! Tolstoy, give me Dostoevsky! No, they want comic books. They read the comic books. But after a while, their taste evolves. They go for less intensity. Okay, I'll read Classics Illustrated. 
Um, then later on, maybe they'll read Mark Twain or something. Um, so your taste evolves in the direction of less intensity, more subtlety, and more variety. After a while, you start on reading, reading uh, different types. Give me a technical book any day. Now let's try some science fiction and read a news magazine and a cookbook and just. So we have this huge world of literature, and we've got this little tiny corner called comic books, which are intense and simple. They're appreciated by naive people and whose taste evolves away from them. Cartoons are the same thing. Uh, you know, intense, bright colors, simple action. Uh, good guy beats bad guy, appreciated by naive people. It's a tiny subset of a huge world called video. Your taste evolves away from this intense, simple experience towards more variety and more subtlety. Computer games are exactly the same way, or at least they were in the early 80s. We are already in the process of evolution. But there was one big difference in the, in the early 80s. With all these other three, it was always kids. Kids like cartoons, kids like candy, kids like comic books. But in the early 80s, everybody liked computer games. Why? Because the real common factor was naivete. That is, we were all naive with respect to computer games. 25-year-old people who'd already OD on candy, comic books, and computer ga and, and cartoons had not yet OD on computer games. Hence, everybody responded to computer games the same way that kids respond to cartoon candies and comic books. Uh, the only difference was kids at least had their parents to say, no, you can't spend that money on that, ca on that candy bar because you're eating too much candy. We were talking about people with a lot of money to spend and no mommy. And so what happened? Atari went boom as kids lined up at the candy shop with fat, you know, laying down their money, give me those carts, anything you got. And Atari was just dishing out garbage and people were buying it. And the whole industry was doing that. We were just, I mean, we were pumping out a lot of crap frantic schedules. Just, you know, hey, if it's a warm body, put him in front of a terminal. And if it works in a ROM, stick it in front of a customer, and he'll give you his 30 bucks. And uh, everybody went wild over these games. Imagine what would happen if candy hadn't been invented, and then Atari invented candy. And that's pretty much what happened with video games. Um, so, it was inevitable that the bubble would burst. Um, basically, everybody OD'd. Basically, it was like, you know, you remember the first time you got your hands on the candy hoard, and, you know, first Halloween or whatever, where you, ah, 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 and then the next morning, mommy. Um, basically, that's what the entire country did with video games. And, in 1983, the entire country woke up and said, Oh, I've got an upset stomach. And the entire country just walked away. And Atari went from $2 billion per year sales to uh, something like $30 million a year in 18 months. Uh, uh, and a lot of other companies died. I mean, the list of casualties, you know, are magic, uh, serious, it just goes on and on and on now giant casualties. Um, how many of you guys were in the business before the... Well, a lot of you were Coinop, weren't you? Coinop didn't go through quite as intense a collapse. It was... Sure it was, it was yes. sure it well, it was a collapse. We, we, were, we were before that collapse. Yes. See, we felt the... the, the yeah, it started uh, collapsing because of the competition. See, you were spread out. Your collapse was spread out over about two years. Oh, yeah. The, uh, oh, with, right. Yeah. <laughs> Boom. Oh, for Centauri, sure. you had, Centauri had a Black Friday that was so scary that you know, <laughs> Oh, oh. Well, with, with the VCS, my, my, uh, at Atari, there were the three divisions. And basically, the way Atari experienced it was, VCS just went, Boom! Overnight. Just dropped to nothing. Uh, Coin-Op experienced a steady degradation. The VCS was cannibalizing Coin-Op. And uh, coin op just went down, down, down over about a two-year period. And home computer experienced, they, they were actually in climbing mode, but they got clobbered for another reason. Yes, there's one thing that, that people kind of never mentioned during that whole time, and that was the advent and emergence of MTV. Okay, and yeah. if you remember, the record stores used to sell cassette cartridges yeah. you know, for the 2600 and then 
MTV came and, and our audience got older, and they matured into that, and we're almost back to 2600 days again. You couldn't buy a Nintendo this Christmas. And you're yeah. also raising a whole new crop of game players. Elaine is, and I am. Everybody is. I mean, all these game players. Don't that don't the Nintendo. 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 This crop is kids. Kids will always play candy style video games. They're always going to be there for kids. The big boom we experienced in the early 80s was all of the kids who were 20, in their 20s and 30s. And basically, they got over that. And that's why we had that collapse. Now these, now we've settled down to a more mature environment. The problem is we don't have the, the universe. That is, with, with food, you've got this huge universe of food, literature, uh, video, you've got this huge universe. But with computer games, most of what we're offering is still pretty much candy. We are evolving, starting to colonize the rest of the universe now. In 1983, it was all candy. Uh, in 83, didn't you have the baby boom? The baby boom just went right through that, and now they're doing that to BMW. I mean, the baby boom is what did Yeah, there was a component boom. of that as well. Um, so, it, it was a complex phenomenon, no doubt about it. But that baby boom growth thing, that was a much slower trend, because the baby boom is spread out over more than a decade. Yeah, but so your you big bulk was like, what, 56 it. through 63, 65, a 10 year hit? Um, but you mean when they were born? I mean, so no, the big baby out. boom, the big, the, the major concentration was like 58 to 63 uh, in birth. They were born. Right. Uh, the, the prime baby boom was born between 46 and 51. And so those people are now in their 30s and 40s, uh, late 30s, early 40s. There's a boom left that came <laughs> from them that is just entering grade school, I believe. Uh, you know, the second, the, the reverberation of that. Anyway, um, the point here is that taste evolves. We can expect to see people, they already have it, actually now this is 2020 hindsight, um, the adult players who have a lot of the money to spend have moved away from the candy games. We are offering them some other stuff, and when we offer them quality stuff, they go for it. Witness, Balance of Power, Microsoft Flight Simulator, a number of other... A uh, golf game has been, Mean 18 has been very, very successful. There are quite a few of these that appeal to a more mature audience and are working. It's just that right now we're still staking out that adult game territory. So uh, um, there's a lot of work to be done. Um, anyway, I think, yeah, it's just about time to stop. So I'm just going to, yeah, let's just open it up here. Yeah, I had one, one thing I thought was. I had to look at the list, and I thought it was missing from the uh, psych psychological implant. And an element which has a lot to do with design is a feeling of control that a good game gives you. Yes. Especially for uh, juveniles that, you know, here, I may not have control on anything in my life, but here I am playing centipedes, and I am incredible at this universe, and I can, for a quarter, come away feeling like I have controlled something. Yes. And that feeds back to game design, and, and the control is an element which you should always make the player perceive yeah. that, that any lack of control because of bad game design uh, is a negative thing. Yeah, that, that control is important. It was the primary factor in the success of the early dedicated Pong style games in the late 70s, 75 to about 78 or 79. Uh, tar these were these dedicated things that just had a little bit of ROM in them, or it was all built on one chip, and they were real dumb, you know, just basic Pong um, running on your TV screen, and they were very successful. And the real reason for their success was not their gameplay. I mean, the games were pretty dumb. Their real success was, for the first time, you could actually make things happen on your TV screen. For so long, you just sat there and watched your TV screen, and people would sit there with these Pong games, and they'd they look at the button and they turn the dial and wow, it moved! And there was this intense fascination that may be hard in the late 80s to appreciate the intensity of people's fascination with their ability to affect something that was happening on a screen. But this represented a major paradigm shift for people. 
the ability to control what appeared on the TV screen. Um, that's the only thing that could have sold those early Pong games, because they were really bad games. So, anyway. Other uh, comments? Open discussion? Yeah. I kind of want to harken back, way back to the uh, safety issue. Yeah. Um, when you were talking about that, I kind of made a, a relationship in my own mind to gratification. Because you talked about how in Balance of Power you don't, when you when you lose the game, you don't show the, the nuclear blast. You just go to that black screen, and you said you kind of sidestepped the safety issue in that case. Yeah. Um, can can you possibly make a, game, a marketable game that doesn't necessarily gratify you, or like at least give you a, give you one instance where you're not gratified, like in Balance of Power? Could would that be marketable? Well, you, the question is, what do you mean maybe. by gratification? Well, because gratification can happen. Well, maybe visceral, maybe levels. a visceral kind of uh, lack of gratification in res with respect to maybe a more cerebral. Oh, okay, yeah. You can trade off different types of gratification. You can say, I refuse to give you any sensory gratification, but I'll give you a cerebral gratification. Text adventures, which have sold well. Um, there's no sensory gratification at all. But there's an intense cerebral gratification when you finally solve that damn thing. So you can trade off different types of gratification against each other. You're going to have to provide some, somewhere. Uh, at some point in the game, you're going to have to say to the player, Good boy! Good for you! Pat, 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 here's your reward. Um, the form that it takes. Without, what you're trying to do. without any gratification, what would you want to play? Right, I, 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 I actually, 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 I did that in some no. way might be in the gratification. <laughs> but actually, I didn't. I didn't. <laughs> the same really music is good. Yeah, there might be a market for that. Well, in a sense, it's a game with a black screen, right? right? I mean, in a sense, I think the ending with of... With a pro versus with a <laughs> watch pro. And, uh, Right. Kill, <laughs> I think the ending of Balance to Power, in a way, by being black and not having a, a graphic visual, I think is, is in a way in a, a better way. reward because it's more, you know, you felt you've done something wrong now. I mean, it's yeah. still... Right, well, it's, it's an it's educational just, well, gratification the ending, you know, as opposed to a it, physical, it visceral... feeling there more than... As opposed to a, vis a okay. more intellectual gratification as opposed yeah. to a visceral yes. kind of gratification. Yes. Well, if video games became much more sophisticated, you would you would get to a level that movies got to during the sixties that gee we've done all these the characterizations, all these things. Let's make some pointless movies. Let's make some movies without heroes, without endings. Movies that just yeah. stop. Well there's some great anti hero movies. Yeah. Well yeah. I mean, but I mean there the are there were a lot of experimental movies, movies, real where money was spent and major studios got involved because, hey, this is the 60s, and we're going to rebel against everything we've ever known, and even traditional dramatic structure. Let's just have movies that start, and they're like foreign films, they end. Okay, yeah, you could make games without gratification, but I think it would take, it would be a response, it'd be a reaction to a rich body of stuff which doesn't even exist yet. Well, the would say, that's a criticism offer again. Yeah, it has on my personality and that big ending and stuff. Let's do something just to like happens and then stops. Wouldn't that be hip? Well, That'd be about 1988 or something, you know, when we get hip again. The <laughs> they weren't around the 60s. The arcade sort of have a non-gratification factor where the arcade point-out games where your gratification is you did pretty good, but you, you could you always do a quarters. little better. And maybe you should right. play again and throw the quarter in. Well, it's limited. Right. 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 There's right. never really well, an end to those, though. There's never a big bang. Yeah. Yeah. Never, you, yeah. you always lose, but That's it's never yeah. that, that brings up something else that's fairly important. In a lot of arcade games, at least, you don't play to win or lose. You just play until you lose. So right. losing has to be gratifying. Mm -hmm. like, like I would say on Secret Service, which if you haven't seen it yet, I'm sure you can see it later, that's very gratifying to lose. I mean, well, you tilt the machine and it's gratifying. It's a postponement of losing. But, it's a consolation. Yeah, it's a consolation in effect. Yeah. But if, it is, if you don't get any gratif gratification on losing, which is going to be the last thing you do in the course of the game, you're not going to be so inclined to play it again. But you get a good feeling by dying. But I think the gratification in coin-out games is improving your score. To last longer. If you longer. took a game with well, no yeah, learning curve longer. and it just wailed on you, there's nothing gratifying and you never right, improve. You can't there's nothing about your big design issue change, you know, big design changes between arcade games and coin games. Right, right. right. Well, Where you've actually yeah, got to spin yeah, yeah, you have to make them, <laughs> compel them to put in the next quarter. For a long time. Right. That's so you had to leave them with something that they enjoyed out of it, otherwise. Well, you can't. They it's just got, always, die. When they die, it's got to be 
because they died and not because the machine decided that they died. Yeah, that's a just point. But, fair. But it, it's a good point up trip to make that event, you know, worth the quarter, even if you never got to. I, I went, I went once to. A, I just happened to find it a Hubert when it was very first on display, and there was some kid there, a little short chubby kid, who was like pumping quarters in it, and I, I wasn't. I was standing off, just kind of, you know, trying not to be, not to uh, destroy the event. I was trying to observe, but I, like, got closer because I, I saw him going in so quickly, and all he would do, he'd immediately put the quarter and start the game, run off the edge so we could go, wow! And a doctor would hit in the cabinet. He loved that. He did it three times quick. I put another quarter in, ran off, got mom, got more quarters, said, this is great. We're on to something here. And I said, this is something I never want to forget. You know, you're going to kill him anyhow. So why not just reward? I give my best explosion for when they blow up. The most rewarding sensory event is when you die. Of course, it costs you nothing. It gets them off the game. Great. Tell <laughs> on Secret Service is beautiful. You're going to have some people who take the game and blow off some of their playing time just to show them this event. Now why not? Especially if you're already doing bad. I mean. In laser war, I used to once. I wouldn't wait around for my bonus, especially since I'm not putting quarters in the machine. I'd always tilt it first just to hear the ha ha ha. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's a real valid test. You know, no, I'm I'm sure. Sure. <laughs> um, but I think coin op. There's some difference. Coin op. Each game is more a part of a larger game of improving the your score and things. The game doesn't end. end. Yeah. The focus yeah. is there on is no the long trend losing. of playing well, there's games. Losing, there's there's no well, no, there's milestones, right. and you end up ceasing play. But but the home games, you're more focused on the during game experience, not so much this continual. Well, you're also saving things game. off the disc. You're actually saving a continuing game that could go over weeks. Right. On, I mean, the know, game experience the itself depth. is the, the primary focus. Where pointing up, I don't know. There's does that trying to get them to play. It's not just one game, you know, that, that one game that you want to play over and over. And it's a larger game for some reason. You know. Can you improve turn after turn? Uh, no. Well, I mean, hard, I, the really point that we're, we're skirting around here is very important. I don't know if Chris yeah, is going to address it. Is, as a game designer, there are very, very different design criteria depending on whether you're doing a, a home piece or a coin op piece. You have more time to look at it. The basics of the piece. Well, yeah, but the quantum piece is, I would, I would suggest, a very much more yeah. restricted so a goal. Restricted right. goal. I mean, yeah. first off, you got to get them off the machine. At a certain time. Right. 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 But the basics that make it an enjoyable game are the same. They're in common. It's just the way of executing those, I think. Well, I don't know if that's necessarily... Presentation of it is different. Well, it's the audience that you're programming for, also, when Chris is saying it. And this would be neat if we could program for the adult who's going to be playing our games. But our target audience is for myself or for whoever we're programming for the arcade. We're programming for males who are 14 years old yeah. to 16 years old. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, I mean, your design goal to making you know, a hit record, a, a two-minute record, or, or doing an album, are very, very different. Let's say I, you can make a CD, make a 60 minute That's why CD. Why the hit always stands out from the album. <laughs> it's usually different. It's, it's designed, it's designed to right. different criteria, which affects everything about how, everything else that would go into the design. If I tell you, you've got to do something that's going to be a total rewarding experience in two minutes, or here, you've got 70 minutes to do that same thing. What are you going to do? Are you going to apply the same process? It's the intensity, the candy. Yeah, but the, the, yeah, the, the true point is, and I think, I think you are addressing more along the lines of the whole market, maybe I'm wrong, when no. you talk about, about the, um, the fact that there's this whole market now of people that have outgrown the, the original boost, the original, this, this whole massive thing that just happened all overnight that they've never been able to experience before, then all of a sudden they outgrow that, now they're out there looking for something a little bit deeper, a little bit more, like you said, they're chasing the ball. And I wouldn't even get into the verbal and the spatial thing, because I think that's, that I kind of have some, some problems with, but just the fact that there are these people out there now that, that, that are looking for something more, and that's, that's something that hasn't really been tapped into a whole lot. I will take a little bit of issue with the fact that the other thing you mentioned about the guy who wrote about the, uh, the video game of the future, and this uh, holographic thing. I think there was. I mean, and I'm not going to say, and I think your point, your point was more along the lines of, let's not concentrate on evolving this side, let's not concentrate on evolving the spatial side, let's concentrate on, on evolving the verbal side. And I have no problem with that, but I don't think there's any reason to stop evolving 
Oh, yes. Yeah. And one more yeah. point I think that needs to be looked into that we haven't discussed are our input devices. I mean, effectively, this hologram thing would require input devices that are not yet available, and that would change the whole ball game of what we're doing, even as far as the verbal things yes. are concerned. Uh, I mean, let's take, for example, balance of power without the mouse. You know, I mean, you could probably do it with a joystick, but the mouse is an enormously important yes. factor in that particular piece. Yes. And that's another thing that I think we might want to look and at. And also output devices. Yeah. Well, that's where the, the holograms yeah. and stuff come in. I, I don't, there's no reason to stop evolving that. Yeah. We, we might want to, pay, I, from a marketing point of view, we might want to pay more attention to the verbal side because there's nothing out there in that, in that respect. Uh, wow. But, but certainly, certainly better input devices, better output devices, and evolving the entire industry as a whole, I think, is important and not concentrating on one aspect of it. Yeah, helping these things, it doesn't, these things don't hurt. Having better hardware is always better. Uh, my observation is that we are, uh, we have reached, I shouldn't say adequacy, but on a scale of one to a hundred and how glorious the technology is, on graphics, let's say we're at 30. We could be a lot better. On input devices, we're at about 10. And then on function, on operations, on what the programs actually do, we're puking along around 1 or 2. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, well, yeah, sure, I'll take as much of this other stuff as I can get. But boy, what are we really hurt? Is that on this operation? Right, and what I, I maintain that as these input devices and as the, as the hardware gets better, it makes doing your yes, type of thing it does. significantly more we, doable than yeah, we waste less time. Than were even two years ago. Yeah, we waste less time sweating the graphics and sound and input devices I mean, and we can pay more attention. You know, all of these things help. For what they've done so far, CinemaWare, I believe, is probably trying to move in that direction, whether they're succeeding or not. not probably that goal is to become much more characterized in, in their work. Well, I think they're, they're taking exactly the wrong path. They may be taking the wrong path, but I think their ultimate goal is basically what you're talking about. Well, from a more they immediate are. point of view is I own a personal computer at home, and there's really no reason for me not to have a, a video game collection that's as large as my record collection. But there's nothing really out there that is interesting to me. I mean, I can play that, you know, the, uh, the motor skills mm -hmm. game for like an hour, but then I'm satisfied. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't want to play that right. forever. I'd right. like to get something that's a little bit more um, challenging yeah, and more intriguing. Uh, but I, I think, think Infocom is your, why would spend all that effort to figure out somebody else's puzzle? But I think finally the hardware is getting to a point where we can make these things a little bit more doable than but, they were a few years back. Yeah, sure, but have we even fully exploited the hardware five years ago? That's, that's the big issue. I mean, Sure, the hardware is way up to make it do incredible things, but we are not up to the level of the hardware. I mean, as far as the programs, the hardware keeps evolving, and we don't really get a chance well, to catch up with this hardware. Like Chris said earlier, that moves along much, much at a much slower pace. Um, the sure, hardware, but but we need to concentrate more on that. Standpoint from a technical standpoint, but I think before still... you can even begin to evolve the art, you have to you have to master the hardware, and I think we're at that point where we're beginning to master the hardware. The, there, this is a problem so here. So 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 there's basics that could have been done. <laughs> that What's that? The hardware limitations. <laughs> no. By the time you master it, technically, the but from a gameplay point of view, you know, I still think. That, I mean, there's technically, yeah, we're keep we're trying to keep up with the hardware for as far as graphics output and sound output and types of things, but as far as fun and gameplay, um, that part of it is always lagging because we're spending so much time on the technical side of it. There's some games on the VCS that I think are is just as fun as anything on the Amiga. I agree. Oh yeah, more okay. fun. I'll, I'll yeah, suggest, pretty much but I think, I think this is all part of the learning curve. Yeah, but I'll suggest part of a reason what cripples our industry along those lines. If you took, we have one fundamental design some X amount of time was spent on that, okay? Let's, and let's say out of a scale of 100, 10% of that time was built making that activity. In today's marketplace, 10, 10 out of 100 was spent on doing that. 90% was converting it to different record players. That's what's crippling us right now. And right. we talked about is why there isn't more personal expression. Why isn't there more money for personal expression for an artist to do his thing? Because only a finite amount of money for technical development. And right now, because there is no standard, there is none. There are four standards right now. We, we, we build to IBM, Macintosh, we don't even build a Macintosh, Amiga, C64, and yes. Apple something, GS or something, maybe five. Okay, and there's an enormous amount of technical, creative people who are otherwise not spending any time doing anything creative except the creative aspects of 
trying to shoehorn an Amiga game into an IBM PC. And because that's our, our, our situation right now, that 90%, and I'll say it's that drastic, is not going to happen until someday a little bit further down the line when some one technology that is adequate, which is not the IBM PC, would dominate and say, this is a record player. Okay, now let's, you know, let's all write music take our for best it. shot at this record. Well, records yeah. and cassettes and CDs are surviving that sentence, too. That's different. No, I, I, takes, I know, takes, that's different. It takes one, one amount of development time for that piece right. that can, can easily translate translation across the board. Translation is much easier. Right. Well, there's um, no translation. There's, there's no translation. It's transcription. It's negligible. It's negligible. Okay. Um, but I still think you could write, I mean, it's quite possible, I mean, balance of power. I mean, you can write a, a game within the constraints of those five standards that you can spend the majority of your time on the game itself and not having to try to get, pull it off on the other games, where you're not fighting the technical boundaries, you're, you're spending your time on the, on the gameplay boundaries. So the way you do that, I, I, I attempted that with Cebu, one thing you have to do is bring down your technical expectations right. somewhat. So, well, least common denominator. Um, and so you do suffer a little bit, Seaboot has no uh, snazzy graphics and no te technical tricks in it at all. It's all very plain vanilla programming so that it'll port easily. You pay a price for that, but I think that's what we have to do yeah, in the future. It's just right. economic reality. If I can continue on, but I think we're getting to the point where the audience is developing to the point. It's the candy bit, right? The first Amiga games were all candy, okay? And as people were just grabbing for they wanted to show off their Amiga. But now there's enough to show off the Amiga, I think. And now people are willing to buy, or becoming more so, to buy games that aren't so much a demo disc for their, to show off that they bought the right computer, but now they're willing to settle and, and buy a game that's fun. So what if it's not the best graphics or the best Leisure Suit Larry? Look at that one. I mean, that one that one's selling pretty well from what I hear. I mean, on the Amiga. Not on the Amiga. I'm not supporting the game or whatever, you know, but just from the fact that the graphics on Amiga standards are hideous. You know, they're, but they're was, double but pixel I, I, 64 graphics. What's the first thing we noticed about, before we even realized it was a good game, the first thing we said is, you know, I've spent all this money for this great piece of hardware that's capable of doing wonderful graphic stuff. And here's the suit true. Larry that looks like, you know, a stick guy with little arms. Graphics yeah. are terrible, we but said. given the choice right now, would you play that or would you play Defender of the Crown or whatever it is that epitomizes... Yeah, well, when right, I saw right? the box, that, that cracked me up. It intrigued me immediately. Yeah. Yeah. suit Larry? Yeah. 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 I, I oh, thought that's it was a great fun. Game. Yeah. That if the game isn't fun with sick people, it's, it's not never going to be great. That's true. It's no. never going to be great. I mean, you can put fantastic graphics and sound on it, but if the basic premise of the game is stupid, it's right. just going to get, you know, passing notice. People will think, well, that's cute. It looks pretty, but it, it'll never, it'll never really catch on. If that's it our argument. So it, that's where yeah. Cinema yeah. Where is right now. That's yeah. what Cinema is. Right. 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 I think that the, the world's greatest right. demo disc are getting sophisticated enough where they're no longer, you know, insecure about their computer or whatever. I mean, they, they're, they're willing to buy a game and play it because it's fun. I mean, I certainly, you know, rather than something that's going to show up. What a novel concept, right? <laughs> well, it's well, you got to justify <laughs> why you spend the money on an Amiga. You have that's to what have I'm saying. the trying to the crowd to say, look at these graphics. They can't right. do this. Because so anybody bought a $500 IBM clone, and they go, you are nuts to spend this much money for a computer that does almost nothing because there's no software for it. So you run out, you get Defender of the Crown, you go, meh, make your PC do that. <laughs> but <an> iron, right? <laughs> but see, I think we're getting beyond that stage now where now people are willing, I mean, I think, or if not in the near future, where you can write a game that's PC graphics that's going to pull, you'll be able to pull it off on the Amiga and sell if the game is designed around that, those aspects. And if it's fun disguised game. PC graphics, I think, like... Uh, trusting the trailers, yes. Yes. where you use like icons or symbol symbology right. that translates to everything. Uh, uh, you make a, a good point, but that's not the way publishers are doing it now. What does CinemaWare do? They go to the biggest, baddest technological right. feat, do it on the Amiga, and then shoehorn everything, and then try, and then you're going to spend enormous amounts of time yeah. trying to chop that up and fit that in a smaller box. Well, we got to keep nice artwork. We can get rid of this game. Just, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. We gotta keep these double screens. Cut, this, cut that, but we'll keep these screens. You know? It ends and up being a, a thirty-nine dollar slideshow then instead of a game. Right. Defender of the Crown. Oh, we all know that. Of course, we haven't but convinced I just, them. Yeah. I just think we well, it's hard to convince you, somebody when they're still not making money yes. doing it. That's the problem. It's a problem. That's a big problem. Now, for a game that's almost done, 
about gameplay versus graphics and sounds, right? And every trade-off that would occur, they would go for the for the cheesecake and, yeah. and throw out the meat. And, uh, well, that's cinemaware. I don't think they have much food chips. Yeah, yeah, I think hope they have audience. enough of a future to make back the money. Yeah. <laughs> we hope they have students. a future that lasts as about a year. As the audience matures past two candy years ago, stage, cinemaware is going to go downhill. They're the candy of the computer game world. Yeah. And as yeah. soon as people... Very sweet right now. They said, like, text game, Infocom is going to stop making all their text games for the Amiga. They say nobody buys them on that machine because nobody wants to sit and look at text. They want graphics and sound on that. Just the ones that usually buy that machine like that kind of stuff. And the ones well, that see, buy this is, a, PC, this is, a, this like is a fundamental rap, problem for these yeah, like machines. Text. I mean, you know, the, you know, the Amiga is yeah. probably not selling real well We're, because of just, no one's supporting the fact, no one's making software for the machine to begin with. There, it's capable of doing incredible things, but it's the only machine capable of doing incredible things. So it becomes, from a financial point of view, ridiculous to develop yeah, software right. for that particular machine. But then, a big enough base. and the poor guys that do develop software for it, along the lines of Infocom, are realizing that hey, their software is not selling because people want more because they've just paid a lot of money for a great graphics machine. On the other hand, technical things take a lot more time than the less technical things, and they don't pay off as well on Unix. But I mean, it's just it's kind of the sad state of affairs where like the hardware now is going to be suppressed. Yeah, yeah, it's slightly worse than well, catch until too, because until the software seems catches to up. be incredibly inept. If they had yeah, spent the worse. twenty million dollars on software development instead of those terrible advertisements on television, it would be a great system they, now. Not even uh, that. They spent the twenty million dollars sending guys door to door to Sears stores, begging them to put in the stores. <laughs> yeah, they please put one on the that. shelf. Would you mind just, just one? one. You have one, Tim. You know, serious. Well, you have the one complete line of Commodore. Could you put this next to it? You know. That's, <laughs> yeah. I mean, from a developer standpoint, you know, the Amiga is really the only good record player. I mean, it's yes. the best yes. record player, yes. and it's incredibly frustrating to see that nobody sells the record player. I saw that coming. I saw I, when I went and looked at that thing back in March of '84, I was, I had two reactions. God, what a seductive machine. And I thought about it and I said, do I really want to tilt at windmills again? Because I'd done this with, with the Atari 800, trying to get people to write for the 800. And I said, no, I'm going to be cynical. I'm going to go with the Macintosh. That machine will sell. The Amiga will spend the next five years wishing and...